Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan Ellis Pierce. This is a uh, a chat that we're going to have today, or uh, I'm going to have, you're not going to have it. You might have a, a, a chat alongside or underneath the video, but I'm going to be talking to Stephen Bendal, who is a great supporter of the channel and has been here, I think, at the channel as a, as a part of the team for a good long time. And uh, has we, we were talking um, through the various mechanisms that I get to talk to you guys. And he was, he mentioned that he was in Ukraine at one point. It might have been on a live chat. And I was like, oh, hello. Okay, this could be, this could be great to, to get some f feedback and some information about um, you know, someone's feelings about uh, Ukraine, uh, experiences with being in Ukraine. And actually, Stephen has connections to Ukraine that go beyond, you know, just visiting Ukraine. And so, Stephen, first of all, welcome. Thanks so much for you know being part of this this team that we got here, and for agreeing to do this. Uh, as I think you've been, have you been watching the channel for quite some time now? Yeah, I have been. Thank you for having me. I, I have been following the the channel for over a year. I've been subscriber since um, last autumn or thereabout but I started to watch the channel I think a little over a year ago so and and yeah. where are you do you give give us some background as to who you are uh, as much as you're comfortable in saying you know a little bit about yourself I'm I'm a average Norwegian I think um, like <laughs> like many people here uh, but um, I'm married to a, a Ukrainian woman, so my, my wife is from Ukraine. Interesting. And, what, whereabouts, in, whereabouts in Ukraine? Um, she grew up in a small place called uh, Porebysha, which is in Vinitsa Oblast. It's um, maybe yeah, a little less than an hour's drive from Vinitsa, the, the city. And um, but she has lived in uh, Kiev for mm, over twenty years. So uh, we we met in twenty nineteen, and uh, I went to Ukraine then a couple of times in the autumn of, of uh, in twenty nineteen. Um, but then um, the pandemic came, so. We had some problems, you know, about traveling and meeting. We had plans to. I, I, I was. I, I had bought airfare tickets for 2020, and everything was cancelled. Everything was locked down, and so we we kept in touch over internet using these chat channels and so on, so we could talk. And then um, she came to Norway when they started to lift uh, restrictions uh, a little. You know, she had to stay in quarantine here in hotel and everything before she could uh, visit me. But okay, we did that. And then I went to Ukraine again in uh, 2021. So I, I was in Ukraine then uh, three weeks in uh, uh, August in 20. One, so that was about six months before the full-scale invasion, and um, I'm very glad now that I did it because I got around and, and we saw a bit. You know, we stayed yeah. mostly in Kiev, but of course we went to Vin Vinitsa. We had a, a long weekend in Lviv, and uh, I actually also had a day trip to um, Chernobyl and uh, Pripyat and saw this, <laughs> that was very interesting. And, and now, God, after this, when, when we saw on TV this column of, of uh, Russians standing all the way down to, to Kiev, and I was thinking they were reporting that they, they made some base there you know the the russian soldiers yeah. and they dug in in yeah. this area and i had been there six months earlier and we had to wear these uh, uh geiger you know this uh, like a tab thing to register how much uh, radiation you are exposed to and everything and we could only stay for this and this many hours and everything was very restricted and they just went there and dug in for weeks. I don't know. 
<laughs> yeah, though, I, it'd be interesting to know what the ramifications of that were because there's a lot of talk. Well, there was a lot of talk about that. I, I guess it's a reflection of how little regard they have for their own soldiers, right? That they would say, "Yeah, go and dig in by Chernobyl." Yeah, didn't something happen around Chernobyl? No, no, no. no don't, yeah, it, a long time ago. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> insane, insane. It's so quite, quite crazy. So. so so yeah, so you you got to know Ukraine in the peacetime a little bit, so that that's nice. Uh, and then you, so what was the situation then as, as the war broke out? What what were your two's existences like in in February twenty twenty two? We were here in Norway. We in in uh, February twenty two, and um, we we were anticipating that something was going to happen and i was like oh, really can they be that crazy you know it's like and my wife was like no you know never and, and her father he was uh, they are our brothers no problem you know Ugh. and yeah. then early that morning because my wife she's very much like a person you know this type you know she she goes to bed early she's up early in the morning she was up in the morning seeing the news and she came wild you know into the bedroom and woke me up and god they are there they are there you know and uh, wow. I, I was just up and started to watch the news and it it was it was some crazy days and we were very worried you know uh, and I presume she was in contact with people in Ukraine often. Yeah. Friends and family, of course. She she had been living in in Kiev since um, I think uh, 80, 1980, no, nineteen ninety eight or nineteen ninety nine or thereabout. You know, mm. so it's like she she had been li living more than twenty years in 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 Kiev. She has many friends there, uh, and and they were close to this. Of course, her parents down in Vinitsa, that is further away. So, but she had contact and talk to, and and um, one of her friends were fleeing from Ukraine. Others choose to stay, and um, and we were very worried these first days, but. I was very convinced if if Kiev don't fall the during the first week, it will be okay. Right. I felt very confident about that. If I really had any good reason to be confident about that, I don't know. <laughs> mm, you know, but I I I thought as long as well, really I, I felt relieved when I saw Zelensky saying President Titut, you know, mm. the president is here. I, I I understood that he was going to stay. And then I really I felt relieved and I, I just thought, okay, if if they hold Kiev the first week, then Kiev will start. Uh, it's. I think we kind of take some of these moments for granted now. They've become part of our background knowledge of, of just how things are. But I think history will look very kindly on on Zelensky for doing things like that. Very iconic moments that he could easily have said, right, for my own safety, I'm going to get out of here. And things could have been very different. And yes, there are lots of different variables that were super important for Kiev not falling, like Hostomel being a disaster for the Russians and all these different things. But one of those components was uh, uh, that incredibly iconic moment where he says, said exactly that. So, uh, yeah, incredible stuff. So you, uh, that would have been a very um, challenging time, particularly for your, for your wife. Then did it, did it become more and more, evident as the days went by that this was this was going to be you know a, a war rather than a quick invasion yeah little by little we we saw that it was going to be to turn into a, a, a war of course because i understand now uh, that the russians were confident that the regime will flee and the people will lay down the arms, you know, that is 
and it didn't happen. And then we saw, we started to see places we know, and especially my wife know, you know, and these soldiers, they started to try to, to surround, uh, I'm just zooming in on my map here now on, on the other screen, um, because we, we have, or my wife, she bought an apartment in Kiev before she met me. So sort of now, okay, we are married. So now I can say it's our apartment. And that is in the west side of the town. And actually when we saw, because they were coming down on the west side, these forces, and they went down to this E40 highway. And, and this is where we saw on the news they were, they were shooting at civilians fleeing from the town. You could see civilian cars, families being murdered on this road. And it's just like two, three kilometers away from my wife's apartment. And also now when I've been there, uh, I, I was there um, November last year. And then we, we drive along this road when we're going up to, there's a big um, shopping mall, uh, one of these... Um, uh, epicenter uh, shopping malls and yeah like the like the one that was just sort of blown up in um in uh up in Kharkiv yeah 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 it's 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 the same same thing there is like um one big part that is uh, this uh, building uh, construction things and another part that are more like general stores and different we we go we went to we, when we go to that store then if if i look from the bus down by the road i can see trenches and and these little like makeshift pillbox thing you know made from mm. bags of sand and everything so the front was that close it's really very close yeah, and and you had, I mean, if you look at the map now, you've got sort of Brovery. Uh, obviously, they they were going into Brovery, weren't they? And no. uh, it was, yeah, just that's on very... the east side. Yes, but on the west side of town, they were coming down there from uh, Hostomel uh, area. Yeah, Hostomel is just up there, and and uh, I we we went to um, we went to Butcher now. Uh, in in August last year to see, but there is much is rebuilt there. But we went to this church with this big wall with all the uh, the names of the people that was killed and everything. But they came down there south of Butcha and down to this E40 highway, and they started to try to get in to Kiev from that side. So it's not so far from, uh, you see there, if you zoom in little and then you go, uh, yeah, and then you see uh, now on, on the, the is it, it's my right side of the screen, there is like a road crossing, like um, it says epicenter uh, E40, you got this E40 here. Yeah, there. An just, epicenter. Yeah, yeah, there, there's the yeah, epicenter. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you zoom in there, and then you see just up a little, there, there is like a road going like um, like a banana shape. Like uh, it, it looks like to, to lay, like, not, not there, the other side. Uh, right. Straight lines there. Straight line, straight line, straight there. Yes. This This is a very nice... It's like a long park. It's um, it's a boulevard with uh, walkways in the middle and trees all the way. Our apartment is just yeah, where you are there, there where you just were. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and on the other side of of this road, in in the woods here on this yeah, where you are pointing now, in in there, I have seen these. Um, trenches and and um, stuff, and I, I think the Ukrainians built on that side to sort of hold them back, and the Russians were just just west of that. So it was pretty close, and it was like she was so afraid to lose the apartment and everything. But 
yeah incredible and uh and then of, of course you know it, it, to some extent the rest is history we've been following the war since then and as it has developed i just uh, before we go on to your and her experiences throughout the war um let's just talk about norway for a second so what was your experience of how norway initially reacted whether there's been any change over time in norway to, for general public support for ukraine and where you kind of stand now and what your thoughts of norway's um uh, support of ukraine mm. i i think most norwegians were shocked in the beginning of course you know there, there were some i i read newspapers a lot and, and some were saying uh, before that it's going to happen and others were like oh you're crazy you can't say that and, uh, and I, I think that is maybe pretty much the same all over Europe and then it happened and and, and I'm happy to say that as we we Norwegians has a tendency to to sort of just take take the right stance so very quickly I would say that the general population here was very much for support and the politicians were for support very broadly you know from west from from right to left on the political scale everyone was broadly and and we started to to send what we could send you know and in the beginning it was norway had these uh, these shoulder held uh, rocket launchers this swedish type we we had some thousands of them and we could send and, and little by little we have sent more now we are donating even f-16s and and I, i'm i'm very happy about it and i'm proud that we we do and of course norway has um, we are one of the countries who have some money so luckily, yeah you you uh, i won't i won't wax lyrical about the fact that you guys well i'm clearly going to now but you guys as part of your um i guess ownership over the north sea the uk and norwegians we have the north sea oil reserves you guys did a sensible thing of saying well that's norwegian and we're gonna if you want to drill there we're gonna have some of that money thank you very much and we're going to create a sovereign wealth fund and and the uk went eh, yeah bp shell you can do what you like we might attack you occasionally and then like for 50 years later or whatever we're like yeah we could really do with that money to pay the pensions and norwich is like yeah thank you very much pension sorted so i don't know whether the sovereign wealth fund ha has anything to do with the, your ability to help more interestingly the uk government is just deciding to go down a, a, a kind of national wealth fund route but anyway uh yeah i think norwegians as you say are in a in a fortuitous position or maybe it's not luck maybe it's forethought or in a position where they can help and uh, it seems like the nordic countries are i mean uh, you know denmark sweden finland norway all seem to be singing off the same song sheet here with regard to support and long-term support norway if i remember were one of the first nations to propose a long-term support package that lasted over a five-year period which i think yeah. is exactly what putin needed to hear absolutely so I only think it's not enough. We we do give, and it's very good. We have we have decided to give over five years, seventy five billion Norwegian krona over five years. But I think it would be better if we gave seventy five billion euros rather than Norwegian krona. You know, one euro quite a big difference. About eleven krona. So yeah, yeah, that would be better. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's ne never enough, is is it? Especially, I mean, the thing I like about th those kind of proposals and the EU then eventually followed suit as well with trying to put structures in place for a sort of five year program rather than depending as say with the us and congressional aid having to be done on a sort of ad hoc basis continually, then in that sense ukraine are only as good as as the next aid package that is secured through someone like the us now uh, yeah it's great that norway is doing that but then norway is a small country relatively speaking in the international military um sector and so it would be really great if every country had that kind of forethought and planning ahead but i mean 
what with with Norway because Finland has uh, obviously a very um very interesting history with regard to Russia right Norway less so what what for for our audience what relationship has Norway traditionally had with Russia we used to be the only NATO country that bordered to Russia mm. uh, and Norway is a founding member of NATO so we we have been in NATO from the first day and we had our small little border to to Russia up north you know so so that is something always when i grew up and the cold war and all this it was always this talk about that norway is like the only nato country bordering russia or soviet union and so we are like the border country to but i would say that norway has always had a very um pragmatic and very um, I, I even I would even say sort of friendly uh, stance to Soviet Union, like trying to to trying to balance. Mm. We always said uh, no nuclear weapons in Norway, no permanent uh, bases, NATO bases in Norway. We had this um, big storage of equipment in Norway, both uh, soldiers from US and UK and so on used to come here for some weeks per year to do some exercise and so on. So we were prepared and so we were trying to to balance and we have Svalbard and because of Svalbard and the Svalbard Treaty and Soviet Union, they had on Svalbard um, uh, Barentsburg the, and this um, uh, pyramiden, uh, they, they had some mining there and we so we had to cooperate about that and then we have the vast fishing resources up in the Barents mm. Sea which is split between Norway and then Soviet Union now Russia and, and we have to co cooperate about these things and also because there are many civilian uh, fishing vessels in this area we cooperate about the the safety, the um, rescue operations, and things like that. So, yeah, there you see. Yeah, it. just just showing people where Svalbard is. Uh, yeah. If if you've watched uh, the the show Fortitude, uh, that's supposed to be set in Svalbard. It's actually filmed in Iceland, but that that's uh, that was part of the storyline as Svalbard. So that yeah, that is quite a, a an interesting place with regard to having Russian um, presence there as well as Norwegian. So yeah, yeah, it's under Norwegian under Norwegian jurisdictions. Yeah. But the the Soviets had legal right to be there, and now Russia has taken over that. So, uh, so we have to cooperate about that. And then down on the bottom of the screen now, you see our tiny little border to Russia and uh, Finnmark on one side and the, the Kola Peninsula on the other side. So that used to be, but of course now the border between NATO and Russia is much, much longer than it has ever been, especially with Finland there and the Baltic countries and so on. So that has changed a lot. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Um, and so, uh, and here we are now, you have just been to uh, to Ukraine. What What was your... I don't, not that you need a justification for going. Obviously, you're married to a Ukrainian woman. So, you know, what 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 made you go back recently, or how many times have you been back since the war uh, has been taking place? I've been twice. It was uh, November last year, and then it was again now uh, uh, June. So we returned just about a month ago from from Ukraine. And how how long were you there last time? This last time in June. This time it was uh, two weeks. Two weeks. And did yeah. you notice a difference between Ukraine and the disposition maybe of Ukrainian people between autumn last year and June this year? Yeah, I, I do. 
um, there are some because when we were there in November last year, then oh, this aid, aid package uh, from U.S. Congress, you know, it was stuck in U.S. Congress. Yeah. This, this was already a, a big deal then, you know. Yeah. And that, I think that did something to people and how they were feeling and thinking. And of course, and, also, and goodness, that was only a that was only a month or two I- into it. Of course, imagine yeah. how they would have been feeling at the end of seven months. Must be. Yes, yeah, of course. Sorry. Yeah, but but it's true, of course. So, and and of course, November being November, it's um, end of autumn, start of winter. It's getting dark. It's getting cold. We we were there for uh, three weeks in November, so we we came 6th of November to to Ukraine and then it was still nice autumn weather there it was like 15 degrees out and it was nice and everything but that time of year the temperature falls very quickly when it starts to fall and, and in the end I think around 21st 22nd we woke up to snow on, in the morning and it melted during the day because it was still maybe three four five degrees in the day but it was cold at night and it's getting darker and aid package stock and people feeling you know it's like mm, not so good and uh, and you found that that june time this time around people were in a better frame of mind absolutely because now the aid is coming in, they they look more positively on this, and of course it's summer, it's warm, it's um, main difference I would say uh, for the everyday life is that now you have this power outage. Yeah, yeah. So it it variates a bit from day to day, but um, normally four, five hours, and sometimes up to eight to ten hours, the power is gone. And, and they, they take like parts of the city at the time, yeah. relating. So, uh, and, and you get some message, like my wife has this app on her phone, and uh, the, there are some like, we, it will, we turn off the power, circa there about and it will probably be maybe this and this many hours but you never know exactly so so when we we go uh, to to some shopping mall or we go for a trip somewhere in town or something and then when we come back and and we come up from the from the underground you know from this um, tube uh, then then we listen are the power because if the power is out, you can hear all the generators down the street. Yeah. 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 So amazing. Of course, all and these little shops, they have their generators. And of course, if you have a little grocery shop, what is the most important? You know, and many, I, I say this to people here you uh, just imagine what's the most important. They would be, oh, as long as you have light and you have some electricity for freezes. the freezes, and then everything is fine. No, no. The freezer, yeah, you know, all these freezer counters and everything. I was going to ask you that because the first thing I went to was like, that's the thing that you need. So, in my house, like, if I lost electricity, it just becomes annoying that certain things have to be reset and all that. But actually, the freezer that's a thing that, that you know, you require energy for all day and, and the perishing of, of lots of food, yeah, yeah, of course. Otherwise, it would be a huge loss, you know, if you lose all that food. So, so that is what's running. And the little coffee shops, you know, they have a small one of these small Japanese uh, um, generators, you know, something like little Honda thing. You just bring, yeah. you know, and and so they can run the coffee machine. So we can go in and have a cup of coffee, and so. Nothing, nothing like a, a beautiful cup of coffee on a summer's afternoon with a smell of diesel, like chugging away. <laughs> no, but yeah, you know, and I, I expect lots of people are using like battery packs and all sorts. They're like ten a penny yeah. over there now. Yeah. yeah. So, you, uh, sorry. 
they, uh, they make do, you know, the, the yeah. Ukrainians yeah. are resilient and they are inventive and they, they work their way around problems. So necessity is a mother of all invention, as they say. Yeah. Um, so when when you were there last time, I guess, and I don't want to make this about American politics, but were people, uh, it probably hadn't come to a head at that point, like it is at the moment with regards to, because, you know, it, 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 it's frustrating that Ukraine's future seems to be inextricably linked to the political wins of the United States. Is that a recognition in Ukraine? Like, do people talk about that? Um I, I would, uh, I assume they they will talk about it now, yeah, because of what's happened recently. But when yeah. I was there a month ago, it was they they tend not to talk too much about it because it's like it's probably in the back of their head, but but you you try not to. You are hoping for the best anyway, you know. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. okay, it will. Joe Biden, he is, he's, he's slow. He, they are trickle feeding us. We want more, but okay, we can survive with, you know. If you go, if you talk about Trump, then it's, oof, you know, it's a problem. It is, of course, it, and it will be a problem. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. So they they do like if you talk about Trump there, and I again, I don't want to make this overtly political, but is there a negative reaction to Trump because of, do they know, are they confident that his position towards Ukraine is a negative one? Yeah, I, I, it's, it seemed, it seemed clear enough to me, but, but it's also divided because there are some who believe in him. And even my, my wife has a friend who, who lives in America, who, who married in America, years ago and uh, they are trump supporters and they think that it will be fine you know trump he will solve everything and ukraine will come out fine and it's no problem and and it doesn't help try to talk about it you know it's just like you can't tell them anything else and also in ukraine there are it's a democracy and people have all sorts of yeah. thoughts and, and of people course. are critical of everything, you know, and even you talk about Zelensky, okay, 60% or something of the population really believes in him, but, but there, there are many who say, no, we have to get rid of him and we need others. And yeah, I it's... About the change of um, solution, he was not this general, oh, you know, then it was craziness and now <laughs> i don't know I, i've got so i've got a former teaching colleague who uh, locally who um she, her parent her dad has a family ukrainian well ukrainian mum and kids and she and the mum is uh you know quite overqualified for the job she's doing at the moment typically and but she is you know for all her views on ukraine she's not a fan of zelensky and i pre presume was probably politically not a fan of zelensky before the war right and you take yeah. that into war and say okay so he's done a good job now but then you start getting restless why haven't things you know gone differently as if like, I, I you know yes you can be quite critical I, I suppose of certain elements but i think overall it'd be hard to fault zelensky for his tireless efforts uh, but yeah, there are still going to be elements of the of the political landscape in Ukraine that just aren't going to be fans of Zelensky. A bit like it, as if you know uh, the U.S. was attacked, right, and Trump was in charge, and he's he's quite divisive, right. But you and you, everyone would have got behind Trump in it, during an invasion. But then after a couple of years, you're going to get those old political divides coming back, where people are like, yeah, Trump sucks. Yeah, but he's doing a really good job for this, some, you know defending the U.S. Yeah, but he sucks, and like so, I'd imagine there'll be yeah. similar things like that. Yeah, it is. But I, yeah. I think it's sound for a democracy. You you yeah. need to have, and and it should be mm. openness around it, and it's okay that people say this. And I don't get so great point. I, I, th there are some that are like you know discussions, and they say, oh, Poroshenko was so much better, and some people they are really they want Poroshenko back, and. 
and some get very angry, you know, it's like, oh, what he did and look what now, and he he and his family went to England and uh, uh, and uh, our guy start, stays here. And But I say, it's okay, just have different opinions because mm -hmm. uh, after the war, you have to, you have to vote in new leaders anyway and and that's democracy that's how it should be yeah it's a really good point what what do you think your um your lowest point during this war has been and what do you think your highest point like emotionally and like in terms of hope or or pleased or displeased about any given situation i would say my my lowest point or lowest points has been this the spring of this year when when the help didn't come and we saw more and more places fall you know in in east um it yeah knowing that it could have been avoided you know what's happening now in donetsk and these things uh, I, I was I was feeling very low for a while then, and I, I was thinking that maybe this is not it's not going well, you know. If uh, maybe maybe Russia could break through, maybe they could actually. What, what if what if they were able to just take half the country all the way to Nipro? They, maybe you know, and but then. When her package came through and things went better, and my high points, that is, every time sometimes goes better. It's, I have had many of them. I, I am fairly optimistic as just my personality is like that. And also I, I look for the things to make me optimistic and so I like, uh, and, and I need to be informed. So I, I always, I, I watch your updates and Jake Bro and uh, and these Ukraine matters. And I, I, I like to listen to those who have, like, can say something. Of course, be realistic, but mm. also give some hope. Mm. So I How feel do you... more, I feel more optimistic now, I would say. Actually. really interesting and how how do you see this ending you know what what's the most likely outcome and what do you think is the most ukraine can reasonably expect i i think that it's reasonable to expect to get all the country back full control of all the country i think that is reasonable is it realistic? I think it, it is realistic under the right circumstances. Give them enough stuff and they will do it. I, I do think that. But then again, if Trump becomes president, if US cuts off, I think now Europe has ramped up. I think this help package being stuck in Congress for seven months was an eye-opener for Europe. It's a really good point. I think really, and I, I hear it here inside Norway also, we, we have Kungsberg, which is a fairly large weapons uh, manufacturer, and we have Nammo, which is also... Yeah, so Kungsberg make the NASAMs, don't they, I think? Yeah. And NAMO makes um, artillery ammunition, yeah. predominantly. They are ramping up and more money has been put into this. And I see the same, I hear the same from like Germany, Rheinmetall can produce more and Czech Initiative. Of course, they are buying from other countries, refurbishing, sending into Ukraine. So at some point, these storages they are buying from will be empty. But at the same time, it, if it gets us like over this period until, because I, I really believe that Europe is capable of producing enough and delivering enough 
of everything. When you see in, in Europe, we, we produce all types of ammunition and artillery guns and other type guns and armor vehicles and tanks and planes. We, we produce everything you need in Europe. We only don't produce enough, but I think we can. It's where there's a will, there's a way. And if there's enough will, you know, it's all about money, really. The the problem with elements of Europe is the is certain political parties. Um, for example, Ursula von der Leyen yesterday was voted back in as the uh, European Commission president, is it? I always get confused. Yeah. But um, she... Good. Uh, she, she, there was still someone from the Confederacy, the the, uh, the Polish right wing government, who was standing up and slagging her off in in the uh, European Parliament. And he said, "There is still." And there was a right winger from uh, Romania who was standing up and you know, had to be hauled out of of the Parliament because they were kicking off. And it's just there are still these elements that that I think are compromised by. Uh, by Russia and by problematic ideology, you think, ah, damn it! We, we, this is so obvious for you and I. This seems to be so obvious, and yet so many people less so. Um, but yeah, like I, I think that seven months was a, like you, you might argue in time, maybe in fifty years' time, that that seven months was a good thing. Uh, in, in by looking at some larger political, I don't know how history will go. Uh, but it might you might get to a point in time where you look back and go, if it wasn't for that seven months, Europe wouldn't have woken up so much and mm -hmm. then got on this um, journey towards an independence from the US. And just as the US might move towards an isolationism from a Trumpian kind of isolationism, you might see Europe stand up and start taking over some of those um activities for the us maybe becoming more of a global player and the us has allowed that and then in 20 years time the us might be going damn it we've lost our power because and it all started kind of there so i don't know that, those are just alternative histories but it is interesting uh, point that you make um what what sorry do you want to say anything to that you know i i have been thinking the same uh, things as as you say there and i think it's important for europe to be able to stand on its own two feet I think that will be good for Europe to actually be able to to tackle own safety without relying on America. Yeah. Of course, if if there should be like a World War Three and and a real huge invasion of all of Europe, and America will come to our aid, we shall take that as a bonus but we should be able to defend ourselves without mm. that. And I, and I agree with that, but I, I think there's sometimes this misnomer in the US that we've been demanding America be here, whereas the reality, as far as I would interpret it, is that America said we want to be there because yeah. we want to be the major player in European security for our benefit back there and for the ideological battle that we've been having for 70 years since the end of the Second World War. So yeah. it's not that we've been going, come on, America, come and do our work for us. We don't want to pay, so come and do this. I think that that's how some people are trying to sell it in the US, but that's uh, not the reality. And it is being part of the US's strategic uh, objectives. Um, mo mo moving away from those kind of big ideas there, let's go back to Ukraine for a little while. Um, have uh, when, you, when you were there this time, last time in June, what was the outlook for Ukraine from the Ukrainians you spoke to with regard to the war? Were they... Were they confident were they as optimistic as you for example people are people are tired they are tired i feel they they are sort of they, they are tired of how 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 life is now and but but they are not they are not tired of the fight sort mm. of you know they are still like we we will win and, and I feel that that, that optimism is, is dominating. It's like most, I've never heard anyone say, no, no, we are going to lose anyway. So let's stop now because we are losing anyway. I've never heard anything like that. You know, mm. it's, it's always, we are going to win. But, but we are tired of this. You know, it's been, it's been too long and, and, uh, 
and how how much longer will it be you know and so and, and so, some are asking me like do you think it will be over before christmas will it be over before next summer you know and and really i must say no i don't think so. i don't think so not 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 by christmas and not by next summer but maybe christmas after maybe in one and a half year when russia is running out of stocks from the soviet union when there are no more artillery barrels in russia you know all these things i think those are the things that yeah and i think i think my personal opinion it, you know and if you've been watching my first morning videos of the day i've been saying this a lot recently which is i think you are seeing that already but it's not going to be something that drops off a cliff you know that suddenly they've run out you know you go into the cupboard oh there's yeah. literally nothing left now it's just going to be over time that you're seeing more and more golf buggies being used more and more motorcycles being used these tracked garden sheds the artillery is getting degraded and it's getting it becomes increasingly more difficult to regenerate these stockpiles refurbish your stockpiles to replace these losses and i think it just gradually just becomes more and more difficult and i think you're i think we're we're into that already um yeah. w whether that translates to uh, real issues on the battlefield that that could give the ukrainians the advantage i don't know because it depends on how much kit the ukrainians get and how many boots on the ground they get um, what, when you were over there talking about boots on the ground, uh, what, what did you ever get a sense that mobilization was an issue? Like, what, did you speak to many young men who no, could I, be I, in I, the I, army? I, I don't speak to, I don't, I don't speak to very many people at all. You know, it's like mainly the friends and family, and and I, I, I try to to talk little, ask little when I'm standing in the queue buying something or something, but. You don't go very deep into, you know, yeah. personal. But my, I, I would, as as I feel, as I see it, as I, what I uh, think, um, people want to fight for the country. They don't want to fight without arms. They don't want to fight without proper training. So I feel it's more. Uh, if if they know that they can get uh, a real training, you know, here some mention this like going to a NATO country and get like a real and get into something and master something, and they would be happy to to be there using some equipment and really do something, you know. But I also I think this is this is what um, Ukraine is planning for now, because I, I I think there has been quite a bit of mobilization. I I know concrete some in Ukraine, which I do know that has been now in enrolled, you know, like are put into the system. And they are not they are not just picked up and then sent to the front like you could imagine they would do in in russia they will get sent and uh, to some sort of training first and some now i i see are going to poland for some training still people are going to uk for training and I think that they are setting up some more training in France. France is going to take them in September, I think, 2,100 yeah, of them. Yeah, I saw that also. But I, I do think that there are happening something that they don't talk about when it comes to trainers from NATO countries doing some inside the country the the something that are like under the radar i think something is happening maybe in the west part of ukraine or something so and um so i think people are more optimistic as long as like give give me good weapon give me good equipment then i will go and sh i think this is amazing. yeah which which i think you know that they are getting the equipment 
you can argue about needing just lots and lots more of it. But what frustrates me, as I'm sure it does you, is the inability to strike these airfields deep into deep into Russia that just like come on, just fighting with one hand tied behind the back. But there you go. It's um, very strange. Yes. Yeah. And I and I do kind of understand it. Like I understand that if suddenly they just blew up a, a whole Russian airbase with American weaponry, like Russia would be like, yeah, that's not cool. So I understand that their reaction wouldn't so much be against Ukraine. They would choose that that would be the US that did that. Mm. And and I, I do understand that it is in it's the job of people in the in the US administration and Biden administration to make sure they don't start a nuclear war right it, it's, it's really easy for us and everyone does it like slags off jake sullivan and, and saying look these are anti-escalation but it's it's a dangerous game because if you get that wrong then that's the end of humanity so it's like it's quite a big like decision but at the same time like every other time red lines have been reached nothing's happened so it's really frustrating. Um, are are you planning on going back to Ukraine again in the uh, in the near distant future? Yeah, we all we are planning, um, and I think uh, we will probably go in October this year. Right. So I'm I'm hoping sometime around that that period myself. I do need to speak to my missus about that though, but <laughs> I haven't asked her yet. Um, hey. I'll see you in Kiev. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Let's have a beer. I'm keen. Um, uh, so, uh, have you? Do you speak Ukrainian? What? Do you speak Ukrainian at all? No, I don't speak Ukrainian. I'm I, I'm learning words. You know, I can say this. Dobry um, day. I I I can order coffee in Ukrainian. I can. Um, and I start to understand little when they speak. I know what they are talking about. I can't. Yeah. I can't say exactly details, but I start yeah. to understand little what they are talking about. You know, and um, I learned the alphabet. I have have it uh, on on my wall here, so I can see when I wonder something, so I can read out the words. Interesting. Uh, Good and, on you. Um, I'm learning little by little, of course, but I'm I'm little old to learn, you know. <laughs> learning too learning much of an old dog. I can't learn you when you're young, you know. Yeah. You drop a five-year-old in Ukraine, and he will speak the language in a couple of weeks. They say one of the best things for the human brain, like as you get older, is to learn a language or learn a musical instrument. They say those are the things that connect yeah. the neur neuronal pathways the most uh, effectively. So, um, yeah. yes, uh, um, uh, I was going to ask that. Um, so you, you are planning on going out again Just with regard to uh, Norway and friends and maybe family members in Norway. Do you find that you speak much about the, the war in Ukraine? Are uh, do you find that no one else is in, as interested as you are, perhaps, to uh, in in the war? Few few are as interested as me. When uh, I would say, in general, some people don't like to talk about it because it sounds scary. Um, some people don't talk about it very much normally, but when I'm around, they have the opportunity to ask because they know that I watch updates every day. I spend about three hours per day to be informed. You know, I, I see everything you put out. I see all these. I have a number of channels I'm following. Mm. So actually, I use I spend about three hours per day. To be do you watch do you watch on like faster speed? Because I watch everything now on 1.75 speed plus on, on... Sure. Yeah, but I'm I'm not so. I think I'm a bit more slow. <laughs> uh, so sometimes when it goes, sometimes I I, I turn it up to one point twenty five and yeah. and uh, of course uh, watching uh, Andrew Perpetua, I can just put it on one point five immediately because then he just sounds normal. Because yeah, I put him on two. Yeah, yeah, he's the one the one that I always definitely put on two times. Yeah. But yeah. So, 
And sometimes my wife likes to see it together with me, and she's not that good in English. And if she right, sits okay. down yeah. and I have turned off the speed, then she's like, oh, what, what? So then I have to turn it down again. So, um, but not one. 175 no that would be too quick for me i'm sure i could learn to yeah it's one of these things you get used to and then when you hear them speak at normal speed you think something's wrong with them uh that's yeah. that's the issue i have um so you know so interesting that, that people know you as as the guy that maybe the go-to guy of uh for for ukraine i can i can say another thing about this yeah. what, what what people that's here it. think and and so on when i was going uh, November last year, I'm uh, going to Ukraine, and I, of course, I'm at I'm at work every day. You know, I work full time. Mm -hmm. I'm an engineer. I work here right. in my municipality as uh, road. I, I have responsibility for the roads maintenance and so on here in in Olesund. I have to tell my colleagues, of course, I'm taking time off now, and I'm going. Where are you going? I'm going to Ukraine. And some of my colleagues, they came to my office and took farewell with me before I went. Really, you know, not like, have a nice trip, we'll see you. It was like, nice to know you. Really, uh, yeah. Miss you, you know, it's like, it's, it's sad you're, you are ending like this, you know, going <laughs> to Ukraine. They were so sure going to Ukraine means death. You know? Certain death, yeah, so yeah, I'm interesting. Surprised when I came back three weeks later. Like, oh, really? You <laughs> what are you doing back at work? I thought you were dead. Yeah, yeah. And this is a bit strange also to me because I know people are living there all the time, and they are alive. And why should goodness me? I mean, you hear about these stories of people in the front line towns that are like literally living in the gray zone between both sides just still yeah. hanging on to their house you're thinking yeah. what um wh what that uh, interesting uh, what uh, what do you really like about ukraine when you've been there the few times you've been there what 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 do you, if you lived in ukraine you know what would it be that you appreciated most about ukraine i love the food really i love i love the food they have fabulous food a great variety and you know they they grow all sorts there all the fruits and vegetables they are fresh and very tasty and everything and all these different dishes they have it's like the reniki and uh, these things I, I i just love it i love it absolutely and it's also it's a beautiful country. I, I really like, but of course, if you live there, it's like I live here in the west coast of Norway and we have the deep fjords and, the, and the, these uh, mountains and everything. And everyone come here and tell us it's the most beautiful part of, of the world. And I'm just like, oh, I have to look, you know, it's like uh, I live here all the time. So you would be used to it if, but it's, it's, nice you know just taking the train from uh, kiev down to Vinnitsa and you see the fields when we drive through you know and now we were there in the summer and uh, and, and the corn fields you know it really looks like the flag you you have the yellow going into the horizon and you have the blue sky over you know it really looks like the ukrainian flag I what would love to go there in the summer because I, I was there in February and it was everything was dark and grey and white yeah. with snow and yeah. It's a oh, big difference. No, yeah. it's it's lovely. And I like the people. I think they are like they are calm, they are like down to earth, uh, and they are practical and they are they are helpful and and solving problems. I I don't know. I, I feel I, I just I feel good when I'm there. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well, look, is, is there anything just before we allow you to get back to your engineering um, so you don't get told off too much? Uh, is there anything that you would like to express that, that, that you haven't said any any sort of topic that you would like to cover? I would like people to, to know that Ukraine is such a nice country and the food is fab and uh, local bears are fantastic and so on. People should go there, you know. 
spend some time there, go for a vacation. And I would say even now, even during the war, unless you are very scared, of course, don't go. But, but if you if you can overcome that there might be some risk, but it's not it's not very serious. Have a trip, really, because it's so nice, and and it's an experience. At, at least, I think for many people, it would be like something to look back at later in life. You know, to I've been there. Even if you just go to Lviv, it's just over the border from Poland. You know. It's, and even if you want to stay away from map. some of these places that might have like strategic targets in, it's a massive, you know, there are plenty of uh, agricultural communities or, yeah. or places out in the middle of nowhere that, that you, you know, you're not going to get hit. But I always think that that if I'm going to put money into a country, I'd like to put money into, into that country. So, yeah, I think so. Of course, for those who have something to invest and those who have some ideas, absolutely go for Ukraine. I think it will be great. I'm sure they are going to win the war. I think Russia has already lost the war, and now Ukraine must win the war. And when Ukraine win the war, there will be a, a boom in everything, the economy, everything will just raise up, you know. Now, Ukraine is on the map now. If you ask people 10 years ago, you know, most people around the world, you know, Ukraine, what's that, you know, now, now it's really known. So yeah, 10 years ago, it's, oh, that's part of Russia, isn't it? Yeah. Now, you now people very much not, no, no. It's what my parents said when I, I, I told them, I, I met a woman from Ukraine and they said, what, are we going to Russia? What's happening? This is, mm. and I said, no, it's not Russia. Interesting. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really hopeful way to end it. And and you know, talking about the the food, I wonder because it's got quite an interesting range of climates there as well. So you can go down to a desert area, and you, you've got your heat, and you've got you know, crime. If you include Crimea in that, you've got the the, the sandy beaches there, going up to you know the mountains. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you can go over the Carpathian Way or you can go up to Kharkiv and it's very different climates that give you things from watermelons and sunflowers up to other sort of crops. So that, that might might feed into that variety of food food that you can get there. Absolutely. But um, look, look, that's been wonderful speaking to you, Stephen, and, and you're always welcome to come on if you have um, any other any other topics you want to discuss uh, i really appreciate this time um that we've spent having a little chin wag and who knows maybe october time if i get the green card from the missus uh, we can have a beer in kiev or something that would be nice <laughs> been very nice it's been very interesting and and of course i've been a little starstruck because i feel like i i, I feel i know you and I, i've been watching you daily for over a year you know and it's like oh and now i'm really talking to him you know so <laughs> oh, it's, it's so funny you say that so i went and gave a talk in in stockbridge and uh, in in hampshire recently and i had people that traveled from different parts of the of of england to come and see me there and, the, you know, I had hugs with people like, I feel like you're a mate. I listen to you, uh, you know, every day and it's like you're yeah. talking to me. And that's exactly how I like this. This is exactly what this is, which is, you know, speaking to to people who appreciate what I have to say. We have the same, same interests and same beliefs. And it's just, yeah, fantastic. So, Stephen, I, I just as an end to this video, um, I really appreciate uh, you supporting the channel and, and being a member of this great community. And, you know, thank you. Thank you for doing this. And uh, hopefully uh, you stay there because I'll close the video. Uh, but uh, hopefully you we can meet up again either in, in real life or here virtually. What are your fi final words you want to say? I'd say uh, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you very much, Jonathan, for the work you are doing. No problem at all. Thank you. Um, anyway, as I say, stay on the line. Thanks, everyone uh, who has been watching this. You take care of yourselves. Uh, and I will be hopefully doing some more interviews. I haven't done many recently, uh, just f through time constraints, but hopefully we'll get a few more under my belt at some point. Uh, to the pips, everybody. <laughs>